So what actually happened during our second Revolutionary War? Let's find out. Welcome to Learning with Sprayberry, where we make social studies fun, easy, and educational. Today we're going to take a look at the War of 1812, also known as America's Second Revolutionary War. We're breaking this up into a three-part series called Causes, Conflict, and Conclusion. Today, we're covering conflict. Now, if you missed the first part, make sure you catch it. War has broken out. We're officially at war with England. Let's take a second and look at it from England's point of view. They've been fighting against Napoleon for a while now. He's expanded his control through a good chunk of Europe. Then we declare war against England to capture Canada, stop impressment, and the English armament of Native Americans. When you look at it from a larger perspective, England wasn't prepared for a war with the United States. Their main focus was on preventing Napoleonic expansion in Europe, which makes the actual events of the war all the more awkward. The United States declares war in June of 1812 and begins planning attacks. The thought was that we could march into Canada and just take it. President Madison assumed that the state militias would be able to accomplish this due to the fact that the U.S. Army was only around 12,000 soldiers and Canada wasn't really well defended. Congress later approved an expansion to 35,000 troops, but it was voluntary service and the pay sucked. Madison's Secretary of War, John Armstrong Jr., echoed this point when he said, We can take Canada without soldiers. We have only to send officers into the provinces, and the people will rally around our standard. Spoiler, they were wrong. Now, I'm not going to go into every battle of the war. I just want to give you a few small overview points so that you get the idea. With that being said, let's dive in. The U.S. sent William Hull into Canada on July 12th. Hull arrived in Canada and released a warning to British citizens suggesting that they surrender or the horrors and calamities of war will stalk before you. This threat is going to be hard for him to keep up because he was sent in with untrained troops. Basically, he was taking the JV team to the Super Bowl. English troops responded by teaming up with natives and attacked Detroit. Hull was afraid that English forces had huge numbers, once they've combined with the Native Americans, and surrendered without a shot being fired. For those keeping count, that's Britain 1, America 0. On July 17th, a British troop at St. Joseph's Island on Lake Huron heard about the declaration of war before the Americans who were nearby. The British troops moved into Mackinac Island and set up a cannon aimed at the U.S. troops in Fort Mackinac. The British fired one shot, surprised the Americans, who then promptly surrendered. That's, that's two zip for those keeping count. As you can see, the onset of this war was not going as well as intended. These two skirmishes left Native Americans feeling emboldened and ready to push settlers out of their territory. William Henry Harrison was dispatched to repel the Native attacks. To make up for the early losses, the United States ordered Major General James Wilkinson and Wade Hampton to take the city of Montreal. Unfortunately, the two officers flat out refused to communicate with each other and never actually got close to Montreal. In September of 1813, the U.S. scores a major victory by taking parts of Lake Erie. This win and occupation gave William Henry Harrison the support he needed to retake Detroit that was surrendered by Hull. Additionally, the battles that ensued, especially at Tippecanoe, helped crumble Native American resistance. At the Battle of Tippecanoe, Tecumseh, a Native American leader who was responsible for rallying all the different tribes against Americans, was killed. His death led to the alliance between all these tribes dissolving. To be perfectly honest, the Native Americans were a pawn in both England and America's plans. Tecumseh had joined with British forces while in other parts the U.S. had recruited and manipulated other tribes. In the Southeast, Andrew Jackson had managed to play different tribes against each other in the Creek War. That meant that the U.S. could relatively sit by and let the two tribes take each other out. In 1814, Napoleon gave up and left his throne, ending the Napoleonic War. This freed England up to use its army in its entirety against the U.S which they most certainly did. Now, the one thing that most Americans remember about the War of 1812, if anything, is that the White House was burned. There's more to that event than just a burning building, though. In August of 1814, British forces slammed through the U.S. at Chesapeake Bay. 
This is important because this bay is close to the U.S. Capitol. The Secretary of Navy at the time ordered the Navy Yard to be burned to prevent British troops from capturing the supplies. On August 24th, British forces marched into Washington, D.C., causing U.S. officials to flee. Can't keep the war going if the Commander-in-Chief is captured. The Capitol Building and the White House were burned. These two buildings were chosen for the emotional impact they would have on the U.S. Additionally, they were the only cool looking buildings at the time, so if you're going to destroy something, destroy something that stands out. Don't just burn down somebody's house. This was the first and last time that foreign forces have occupied the capital. Cool story time! While the White House was being attacked, Dolly Madison, the first lady, wife of President Madison, ran back in the White House to save historical artifacts, including Washington's presidential portrait. So the reason that we still have that portrait, the reason we still have that portrait is in part due to Dolly Madison who saved it. Less than a day after the attack, a huge thunderstorm, some people say a hurricane, hit the coast and put out the fires that the British had set. U.S. citizens at the time naturally thought this was a message from God that the U.S. was supposed to win. The storm additionally spun off tornadoes that hit British forces and destroyed two of their major cannons. Yay for us! Except these tornadoes also killed American citizens. This was dubbed the storm that saved Washington. Alright, so I can't believe that I forgot this when I was going over the battles of War of 1812. One of the big battles that I forgot to mention was the bombardment of Fort McHenry. This is where British forces along the Potomac River bombarded the fort for overnight on September 13th and 14th. Francis Scott Key was present at this bombardment and later wrote the Star Spangled Banner upon seeing the flag still fluttering in the breeze after the bombardment. This poem was later set to music and became our national anthem. Shortly after this, in December of 1814 to January of 1815, the Federalist Party, tired of war, met to discuss its options. Federalists felt that the Democratic Republicans were seizing too much power in the government through their embargoes and their unfair representation over the Three-Fifths Compromise. The idea of secession, breaking away from the U.S., was brought up. Imagine how this looked. A major political party, in the midst of a war, is talking about splitting off. Much to the Federalists' dismay, peace was being negotiated while they were meeting and arguing about the war. A peace treaty was worked out between England and the United States on December 24th of 1814. This made the Federalists look really stupid and ultimately killed the majority of their support and subsequently their party. This wasn't the only problem with the peace deal. You see, it takes a while for information to come from across the ocean. The treaty was signed in Ghent, which is now part of Belgium, all the way in Europe. Unfortunately, British forces hadn't got the message when they decided to attack New Orleans on January 8th of 1815. British forces under the command of Pakenham attacked General Andrew Jackson's forces at Rodriguez Canal. Jackson's forces were triumphant and this, coupled with his success in the Creek Wars, propelled Jackson to Washingtonian status. Time for question of the day. If you had to declare a winner based on just the battles, who do you think won the war? Let me know down in the comments below. Now let's hit up subscriber of the week. This week I would like to thank Glass Memer 2000. Thanks for watching Glass Memer 2000. Keep it up. If you like what you saw, click like. If you want to see more content, click subscribe. And if you want to get notified about content, click the bell. Check out my social media handles to see what's coming up behind the scenes. Thanks for watching Learning with Sprayberry, where we make social studies fun, easy, and educational.